Our next two presenters will be Dan Loy from the Iowa Beef Center. He's the, our Iowa Beef Center director. He's also our state feedlot specialist at Iowa State University, Extension and Outreach. And with him also, his uh, co-partner on this presentation is Sean Schaus, who is an Extension Ag Engineering Program Specialist, kind of like Chris Cole that you heard earlier, while he's down in the southwest corner of Iowa, and they will be visiting with you about their research on hoop buildings. So we're going to dog and pony show this, and, uh, and I'm the dog. Uh, but first of all, first of all, I want to, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here and visit with you today. We're going to share with you uh, uh, here in a bit, uh, some research that we've done at Iowa State University. This is research that was conducted at our Armstrong Research Farm in southwest Iowa. So um, this is uh, research where we can, uh, involving uh, comparison of the hoop building to, uh, as Robbie affectionately calls it, the Iowa system. And we'll get to that in a little bit, but as part of this, we want to just uh, share with you that not all hoop buildings are the same. There's some variation with the hoop buildings, and as part of our extension efforts over the past few years, we've had the opportunity to see different types as parts of field days and demonstrations, and we just want to share very quickly here a few differences in some of the, the types of hoop buildings that we've seen. This is actually one that was from Washington County in eastern Iowa that shows uh, the wooden bunk construction uh, in uh, a, a typical hoop building. Sean, do you have anything else you want to say about this one? Yeah, this was an earlier version. I don't know if you'd even find one like this with the single pipe arches close together, uh, probably four foot spacing between those pipes. Uh, most of the companies now switch to trust arches and put them a lot farther apart. Uh, this is another one in Story County, uh, a little bit larger building with the, the steel uh, hoop construction. There's several of this. We'll ask Sean to comment on on uh, this one as well uh, in, in terms of its construction and engineering. This is one that also has the drover's alley or the cattle alley in the back uh, to help facilitate cattle movement. And I think they just they added a, kind of a lean-to on the back side of this hoop to, to get the roof out over that drover's alley, kind of an interesting design. Again, another one. This is in Floyd County, and this I think this is your slide, Sean. Uh, yeah, I don't remember why I put it in there. Uh, just uh, uh, longer than some of them are, a fairly long, 400 feet narrow feet. building. Yeah. And a shot from uh, outside that building. Because the building was so long, they put gates in the middle of the feed bunk uh, so they didn't have to travel the whole 400 foot to get out of the building when they're taking bedding in and bringing manure cattle out. This is a different facility, correct? So this is... Uh this is a facility with three different uh, hoop buildings side by side, kind of an interesting uh, combination of the way these are put together. Now the center building in this case has a, a feed alley running right down the middle of the building, so uh, two sets of feed bunk in there. You look at that and say there's not possibly enough floor space in there. They've got all three buildings connected together with alleys so the cattle can eat uh, in uh, either the center building or one of the two side buildings. Uh, the side buildings don't have feed bunk on both sides, just on one side of the building. Uh, interesting note about this one, though, is because the area in between the buildings where the buildings are connected is open to the cattle, uh, this actually isn't a confinement building by Iowa rules. This is an open feedlot with sheds, uh, so it falls under different environmental regulations because of that open pen space between the buildings. And this is another uh, building, uh, hoop building in uh, Story County, where basically this becomes an open lot with shelter, much like the Iowa system, as, as uh, Robbie talked about. This is an open dirt lot where the hoop building is simply used as a, as a, a typical building for shelter for the ant for the cow. So the, uh, the research that was done at uh, the Armstrong Research Farm, my involvement with this was as part of uh, what we have called the Hoop Group. It was kind of a, a group of us that got together and talked about this work and, and helped uh, design the research early on. But the people that really did the research were Sean and Daryl Busby, who's in, in this photo, and Dallas Maxwell, who's the cattle manager down there at, uh, at the research farm in, in southwest Iowa. So they're really the ones that, that deserve the credit for this. This study came about as uh, early, in, what was the time frame that, uh, that this first started, Sean? The, 
the open feed lot was built, I believe, in 1993 or four. Uh, the hoop building was built in 2004. In 2004. So uh, uh, prior to that, there had been some construction of monoslope buildings in, in this area, basically, in South Dakota, southwest Minnesota, northwest Iowa. And, um, and so um, the, a group of uh, advisory producers to, uh, to the Southwest Iowa Research Farm suggested that, well, maybe this could be done in a hoop building. And so uh, they made the decision to go ahead and put this hoop building together. And so this research involved a three-year study with six turns of cattle comparing this facility to the uh, more traditional facility that Sean will describe in a little more detail, I think, in about the next slide. Yeah, okay, so you got to realize this was 2004. Uh, we didn't have the benefit of all these other panelists know a lot more about uh, bedded beef confinement than we did in 2004 because we couldn't find anybody who had done this in a hoop building. Uh, lots of hogs in hoop buildings, but in 2004 we couldn't find any cattle in a hoop building, so we were taking our best guess at a lot of this stuff. Uh, in order to compare these two facilities, we kept uh, 40 head pens in both facilities so we could compare them easily. Uh, we're comparing to an open lot with a shed, uh, the Iowa system. Uh, we wanted to monitor the environment, the labor, and the performance of the cattle in both systems. Uh, an aerial view here, you can see the open lot with the uh, shelter that was there uh, to start with. Uh, we went just northwest of that building and built the bedded hoop building. Uh, we turned it north and south, which you don't see very many of them that way. The reason we did that uh, is because split into three 40-head pens, if we had turned it east and west, we were afraid on summer afternoons that west pen wouldn't be able to get away from the sunshine uh, and their performance would suffer on the west end of the building. So we turned it north and south and thought that uh, short building, only 120 feet long, it'll probably get good enough end-wise ventilation in the summer. Uh, we don't have to turn it with a, a long side wall facing the wind. Uh, there's a plan view of the hoop building, uh, 50 foot wide. It's got 20, originally had 20 feet of concrete uh, apron along the bunk, 120 feet long, split into three pens. Uh, because we didn't want to use up any more bunk space for gates, we put gates in the back wall to go out to a drover's alley that connects to the other facility so we could use the same working facility. Uh, looking at it uh, from the side, 50 feet wide, uh, 10 foot side walls that the hoop set on makes it about 26 feet high to the center of the arch. Tongue and groove wood liner on the back wall to protect it from the wind and the uh, summer sun. Uh, feed bunks on the east side outside the building posts. Uh, it's got a four foot awning that hangs out over the feed bunk to try to protect that from uh, rain mostly. It doesn't do much for snow. Uh, as I said, that 20 feet of concrete apron, the first 10 feet of it is sloped away from the bunk to try to move manure a little bit away from the feed bunk, half an inch per foot uh, slope there. The next 10 feet is flat. We started out with geotextile fabric in the back and covered it with six inches of uh, crushed limestone. It's what the locals call limestone screenings, uh, too coarse to be sold as ag lime, too fine to be sold as road rock, kind of a waste material from them. Uh, started with that in the building. So that's uh, the way it looks like uh, kind of pinned across there for the three pins. Uh, this is laying down that limestone screening, so I just rolled the fabric out and then backed the truck in there and started uh, spreading the limestone on it. Uh, it was pretty wet when we put it in. There was mud underneath when we put it in. We were really concerned about that, uh, but it turned out to work fairly well. I'll go to the next one, Dan. Uh, uh, here's a, a shot uh, freshly bedded uh, because we only have 120 head capacity in bedded confinement. We couldn't justify the cost of a bale processor to put bedding in, so we just set the bales in, cut the net wrap off of them. Uh, if the bales are dry, the cattle tear them apart pretty quick. Uh, if they're kind of wet, uh, it takes them a little longer. A dry bale, they'd have all spread out in about 15 minutes uh, in the pen. Uh, when we clean that floor out, that limestone screenings, uh, you can see the, the bedding pack get uh, from 8 to 16 inches deep back in there. We clean it after each turn of cattle, so 110 days roughly. Uh, not a real deep bedding pack. And that uh, limestone floor, as long as we kept it from getting too wet, held up pretty well. It would kind of polish with the loader bucket when you went over it. Um, if uh, got extra water on it, like where those gates are in the back wall, and some water could seep in from that back alleyway, uh, that limestone would get a little soft and the cattle would kind of tear it up walking on it 
It had to be patched occasionally. We have since uh, replaced all of that with concrete, so we've got a full concrete floor. There's kind of the way it was polished. Uh, and there was mention earlier from one of the panelists that uh, if you put me in there with the tractor and loader, I would tear up that limestone floor in no time, uh, along with the wooden walls and a lot of other things. Uh, so if you're really good with the loader, you can probably make that limestone work, but nothing beats concrete for durability. Uh, so there's a summer and winter shot of the building, kind of looking from the southwest. Uh, the difference you'll notice is uh, we've stacked bedding bales as a wind braid. Uh, first year, Dallas just did that on the north end of the building, uh, and after once through a winter, he decided he was going to do that on the south end, too, because we can get some pretty raw south breezes in the wintertime, too. This sits up on a hill. Yeah, we're, we're really well exposed, right on top of a hill with no trees around us. So in the summertime, it's wide open north to south, and we get good airflow through the building lengthwise, even though that west wall is entirely closed up. Uh, works really well in the summertime. We've never been able to see any heat stress on the cattle being in the shade there. Uh, bedding bales stacked up there. We leave that gate open so Dallas can bring uh, bedding in and manure out uh, the north wall. So the, only about two-thirds of the north wall is protected by that stack of bedding bales, uh, the south wall as well. Uh, when we do get snow blown from the east or northeast, it blows into the building, pretty well cover the floor. Uh, not real deep, uh, but it does require a little bit of bedding adjustment uh, when you do have a blowing snow coming in. Our comparison facility there has 125 square feet of earthen lot with mounds outside, 25 square feet of concrete floor inside the building uh, per head, and the bedded boot hoop building there is in the background. That's a shot inside the comparison facility uh, that does get some bedding as needed. Dallas just uh, beds it when it starts to get a little too sloppy on the concrete floor. So uh, we'll just get right to some of the data here. There were, uh, this was a three-year study, went over three years, and there was two turns of cattle each year. So this represents six turns of cattle that went through both facilities. And as, uh, as Sean mentioned and as Robbie alluded to, the control facility is uh, what we re felt represented about as good in terms of performance in southwest Iowa, Iowa in general, open lot with shelter as any facility. So keep that in mind as you look at these, uh, these comparisons. So just to summarize the, this data, there was 18 pens all together with, of each comparator from each treatment, each comparison. Again, that was over a three year period making that comparison. You can see the, uh, they were similar in initial weight, about 100 days on feed, so to get two turns through there, um, they, we had to use some heavy cattle, so they had to be uh, less than that. This actually should be 905 as the initial weight. I see a typo that I didn't notice before. Uh, but no difference in final weight, no difference in average daily gain, no difference in dry matter intake, which was very good dry matter intake, 27 and a half pounds, and no statistical difference in feed conversion. The only statistical difference was a small difference in mud score, uh, which favored the hoop cap. So our summary from three years of data comparing these across those two facilities that, that was that there was no difference in performance between those facilities. And I think that would be consistent with what uh, Dr. Pritchard saw with the comparison of the deep bedded housing and the open lock with shelter uh, in the, the South Dakota work. Going to carcass data, there was a question earlier about carcass uh, data in um, in uh, deep bedded housing facilities. Um, no difference in uh, statistical difference in dressing percent, fat thickness, ribeye area, marbling score, no difference in percent choice, no difference in any of the quality grade uh, that we see here. The, the second study that was conducted that uh, uh, and it re related to some questions that we were getting after the completion of this study is what about stocking density? We were noticing that some of the producers with the, were looking at hoop, both hoop buildings and monoslope buildings were starting to crowd the cattle a little more to get that per head cost down. And so we just, there was a study designed to look at different stocking rates and evaluate the different performance as we go from 50 to 45 to 40 square feet per head. The studies that you saw previously were all done with 45 square feet per head. So this was a, a comparison. There were two turns or four, uh, four pens each uh, with, uh, with uh, this particular comparison. That was two turns, right, Sean? I believe it was. 
And so a total of 115 days on feed in this case, again, heavy cattle, uh, eight, upper eight weights. And you can see the, the uh, differences or apparent differences in final weight, average daily gain, dry matter intake, and feed conversion. Now, none of these differences are statistically different. So there's different ways you can interpret this. Some would interpret this and say that there's no effect on performance by increasing stocking density. Uh, some will look at this and say, well, there appears to be kind of a trend there. And I think the basic conclusion is, is that if there was a difference, we didn't have enough replication or there was enough variation in, uh, in these studies that there was no statistical difference here. Can we rule out the fact that increasing density from 50 to 40 head may reduce performance somewhat? No. Uh, can we say that, it's, that, that, that this difference is really what we'll see? Well, since it's not statistically different, we can't say that either. So we'll all let you make your own interpretation. Uh, this, uh, this table is, is in your proceedings, and you can read through that uh, in your leisure. Uh, similarly, well, it, with carcass data, again, there's clearly very little difference here in, in the carcass data as I look, uh, look through this. Similar carcass weight, similar dressing percent, fat thickness, marbling score, uh, and, uh, and quality grade. So, Really, really no difference in carcass data as well. So, Sean, what are the keys to success? Uh, as, as I see it with any of these bedded facilities, bedding, bedding, and more bedding is the main thing to keep in mind as you move to this type of system. Uh, we use five to six pounds per head per day. Robbie said they were just under five pounds per head per day in, in their bedded facility. Uh, not much difference in bedding use between winter and summer. That's something people you heard it mentioned earlier today that uh, humid weather in the summer might be your highest bedding use period. Uh, that's hard for people to adjust to the first couple of years if they're coming off of open lots uh, where the only time they bedded was uh, in the winter. Uh, here you're bedding year round and probably more bedding in the summer than you are in the winter. Uh, cleaning that uh, apron near the bunk, you hear most people say even if they leave the bedding pack in there a long time they want to get uh, that that wet manure away from the bunk more often than that, probably weekly or, or more or so even. Uh, that bedding pack can stay longer and I don't know that there's a good answer for how long is the right length of time. Uh, a few months, six months, a whole year, uh, you, you see people doing it all those different ways. Uh, I think Dallas, uh, who manages the buildings, would tell you uh, there's no recipe for this. It's highly dependent upon what the weather, the humidity is doing and the wind through the building, how much you can evaporate. So you just got to watch the bedding pack and do what you need to do. Uh, airflow can affect that, kind of alluded to that already. And in fact, uh, we're thinking, you heard Chris talk about how many inches of uh, manure and urine gets dropped in these buildings. That's a lot of moisture to try to soak up or evaporate either one. I think you need both to get the job done successfully. You, you need some evaporation out of that uh, manure. Uh, so you need the airflow through the building, and sunlight sure doesn't hurt. Uh, but uh, when you don't get the airflow, you've got to have the bedding there to soak it up. Uh, and size matters. Uh, the, the tighter you pack the cattle in the buildings, the more difficult it becomes to manage the bedding pack. Not impossible. You can do it. Crowd to clear down. We've heard people go as low as 28 square feet per head. Uh, and it can be done, but it makes the management, I think, a lot more difficult when you crowd them that close. So uh, for good ventilation, people ask me, you know, what, what should you do for ventilation? I say, you know, you just got to keep them protected from the worst of the elements. If you can protect them from the worst of the winter winds uh, and from the heat, uh, the sun in the summertime, uh, you're doing good. So uh, use your curtains, your bedding bales, whatever, to provide some protection from the worst of the winter winds. Uh, if the wind isn't howling and they're not being covered with snow drifts inside, uh, temperature doesn't bother them. They, these are cold buildings. They're only going to be two, three, four degrees different inside than the outside temperature. Uh, so you're not trying to keep them warm, but they don't care about warm is what the animal scientists tell me. As long as you can keep them dry, uh, they're fine with cold. So uh, do what you have to to maximize the summer airflow, uh, to keep them cool in the summer and evaporate more moisture out of the building. Make use of the sun and the shade, uh, the high sides of a monoslope or the high open end on our hoop. Uh, that sunlight sure doesn't hurt anything in the wintertime. I don't know whether it changes the cattle's uh, performance or reaction a whole lot, 
uh, but it sure will help evaporate a little bit more moisture off of that floor if you've got sunlight on it. Uh, and having the shade in the summertime then is also a great benefit. And uh, use durability where it matters. You've heard people mention that several times. Uh, concrete walls five feet high, they're great. Uh, concrete floor is better. In Iowa, technically, it may be illegal to put anything other than a concrete floor in these because they're confinement buildings and the standard for uh, nutrient control, pollution control for confinement buildings is zero discharge. So you, you heard earlier, you know, the crushed concrete provides some drainage. Uh, that's true. Uh, and, and probably is good for keeping the bedding pack in good shape, but in Iowa there would be questions about, okay, if you're draining uh, urine and manure-laden water through your floor, where is it going and are you containing your manure? So uh, there's questions. Uh, so far the DNR has not pushed that issue with the producers who have partial concrete floors, but they could because there's evidence that there is some nutrient migration down through the soil under those partial concrete floors. And managing the roof water as one of the primary differences, uh, it's a lot easier to hang a gutter on a building that has a metal roof and, and a wooden sidewall. Uh, it can be done on hoop buildings, and you see gutters on an increasing number of hoop buildings. It's just a little more difficult to figure out how to get it done, to get the water off the roof and into the gutter, and what do you hang the gutter on? Uh, but it can be done, a little more difficult. The last thing, Beth, one of the things we get asked about is longevity, and this is uh, one of the was one of the first hoop buildings built, and it's still there. So that we really can't answer that one yet. So. Questions? Do we have time for a couple questions? Way back here. Yeah, questions. Does a ridge vent either on a gable roof or a hoop building make a difference? Our first tarp actually did have a ridge vent in it. Uh, the first tarp only lasted a year and a half till a windstorm tore a corner of it loose. Uh, when we replaced it, we did not put a ridge vent in the second one. Uh, our observation after the first year and a half was we didn't think it was necessary as short as our building was. Uh, my answer would be, yeah, I think the ridge vents do help. Uh, more so, the longer the building is, the more important I think that becomes. Ours only being 120 feet long, I don't think it makes enough difference to amount to much. But on those that are four or 500 feet long or 1,300 feet long, like you saw one example uh, today, I, I think the ridge vent would be helpful and worthwhile. It's my opinion. Is the cost of bedding included in calculations? Uh, well, Robbie included cost of bedding in his calculations. You average using about five, four and a half, five pounds a day. Yep. So the, the cost of the bedding would be uh, whatever the current cost of that bedding is, plus the labor and, and, uh, and cost to deliver it to the, to the pan. So that would vary year to year. We heard it mentioned before, I think the ideal situation is if you can take uh, the stalks, uh, we, we always think of corn stalks in Iowa because that's what we have. Uh, if you can take the stalks off the field, use them for bedding, and put them back on the same field, that kind of answers the question about are you hurting your field by removing uh, that organic matter and take it back out there after it's been used as toilet paper, right? Uh, then uh, you've got the organic matter going back out with some added. Uh, but it is a lot of bedding to manage. You've got to be ready to move a lot of bedding in and out. On, on the bedding thing, I've got to throw in a zinger. The more distillers grains you feed, the more bedding you will use. Anybody tell you that before? It increases the water output in the pens a lot. And so when, when you're figuring, if you're at your limit on bedding and you're trying to decide if you want to feed more or less distillers, make sure you use the whole equation because it does increase the amount of material you need. I had a, people ask sometimes, can you get by with less bedding than five pounds? And, and you can, yes, it'll, it'll just make for dirtier pans, dirtier cattle. Uh, we had talked to one producer who was custom feeding uh, multiple pens in a bedded building, and he had one owner uh, said, uh, you know, on my pen, try it with no bedding. I'd, I'd like to see if we could make it work without bedding. Uh, and he said that once was all it took to try that, to decide that that was not acceptable 